I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Karen Robinson. I'm the program director of Speak Truth to Power. I know that we have students from Spain and Italy and Switzerland and Canada and across the United States joining us. And I know uh, we have your teachers as well. As well. And I want to um, have a shout out to teachers who are navigating this virtual space and um, advancing learning in, in ways that really broaden the scope and understanding of their students in light of this craziness that we're living through. I also want to send, uh, say of my great appreciation to our partners at the Nisami Gunjav International Center and our friend Robeshawn for helping coordinate the speaker series. Um, again, we have an opportunity during this, this time to bring voices and ideas and thoughts and, and leader, hearing from leaders that perhaps we wouldn't have thought to do otherwise. So thank you so much, Robeshawn, um, for opening up these opportunities for us. Today, we find ourselves um, in really challenging uh, times, really turbulent times with a global plant pandemic, climate crisis, violent conflicts, rise of, rise of nationalism, critical elections coming up. And voices like that of our speaker are so critically important. She has been a powerful voice and an important voice on issues of security, hard and soft power, democracy, social justice, dialogue and diplomacy for years. And um, I couldn't be more thrilled to have her kick off this session. She is a hero of mine, for sure. Um, so I'd like to introduce to everyone, President Vera Weichbreitberg. She was the sixth president of Latvia, the first woman to hold this post, and the first woman to lead a post-communist country. Her story in and of itself is inspiring, um, and her work um, from when she was president and continued today um, is transformative. So I'd like to now pass over to you, Madam President, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Karen, for these kind of words. Uh, good morning, America and Canada and, and, and places on, uh, on the American continent. Uh, good afternoon to Europe. Uh, and uh, to Rovshan Muradov and the Nizami Ganjavi Center in Azerbaijan. Uh, in these days of electronic communication, uh, we have the advantage of being simultaneously uh, in different places or meeting people from simultaneously different places. And it's exactly like folk tales used to tell us about the wonders uh, of, of marvels of magic uh, and imagination and so many of them have actually come true, uh, they, they're real, except of course we can't touch each other physically. Uh, it's a bit difficult to get different continents on the same wavelength, but we can store this information and see it later, another marvelous advantage of our electronic age. Um, I am here as, uh, as a former president of Latvia and somebody who truly has uh, a commitment uh, to, the, uh, to the concepts of freedom and democracy and, and human right, right. Um, much of my personal life and that of, of my native country uh, has been marked by the lack of these very, uh, uh, of these very ideals being realized uh, in practice. Uh, I was born in Riga, Latvia, uh, just uh, before the Second World War. Uh, an independent country of Latvia was created uh, uh, after the First World War, along with a number of others. Ten countries were born after the First World War and the Versailles Treaty that, that put an end to that war. Uh, on the 18th of November 1918, uh, Latvia declared its independence. We celebrated our centenary um, two years ago. Uh, unfortunately, of that uh, hundred years, fully one half was spent under totalitarian rule and foreign occupation. Uh, the Soviet Union invaded uh, Latvia uh, in 1940, a year after um, Germany invaded Poland and the Second World War started. Uh, their army was, was pushed back by an invasion of the, of the Nazi, by the Wehrmacht. Uh, and uh, at the end of the war, when the uh, Germans are losing, uh, the Soviet forces kept marching back over, back and forth across our land. So they came back, they occupied and they stayed, uh, just as they stayed in Eastern German, in East, in East Germany and uh, some East European countries. But the difference was 
that the three Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, uh, had been already, uh, as it were, handed over on a platter uh, to Stalin as leader of the Soviet Union, the absolute leader, uh, during the conferences of the Allies, Tehran and Yalta, uh, during which both Prime Minister Churchill, representing Britain, uh, and President Roosevelt uh, handed over the Baltic countries uh, to Stalin uh, because he asked for them uh, in return uh, for the participation uh, of the Soviet Union uh, becoming allies against uh, the, uh, the Nazi uh, German forces. So we were in a way sold down the river uh, even though uh, the United States mercifully never recognized the occupation and annexation of the three Baltic countries, neither did Britain, neither did France and, and most democratic, uh, in fact all democratic countries did not recognize the forceful, forceful annexation uh, and occupation, but it only to, uh, came to an end uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. The Latvian elected representatives which had been allowed uh, during the perestroika period uh, had voted for independence already in 1990, in May of 1990. But it was still the, uh, the Gorbachev and the Soviet power was still in place. And it's only after the August Putsch of 1991 that the Soviet Union finally collapsed and a number of formerly captive nations, as the Americans used to call them, were freed uh, and became uh, could make their choice as to what kind of regime they would follow. Uh, Latvia, along with its two Baltic neighbors, Lithuania and, Lat and, and uh, Estonia, uh, took the most definite uh, sort of course of returning to the West, where they felt they, they belonged, uh, announced their desire, well, instituted, of course, the, Latvia recreated the constitution it had created uh, when it was founded in 1918. Um, declared in 95, already in 1995, its desire to become a member of the European Union and shortly after uh, as well uh, to become a member of NATO uh, for security. Uh, there was some doubts whether these countries will be ready for the European Union, but we promised to work hard and, and have all sorts of reforms and did that uh, and, and did join in 2004. Uh, and. Uh, the uh, desire of the Baltic countries to become members of NATO was greeted with, with some uh, reluctance. And uh, uh, I'm rather proud of what I did uh, uh, to, uh, to convince our partners, uh, notably members of the uh, United States Congress and Senate, who would be voting on the enlargement of NATO, that A, NATO should be enlarged and B, uh, Latvia and our neighbors, our Baltic neighbors, should be admitted to it, which happened. And we are very happy uh, that this was the case. Uh, a few words now about um, where we are. You can Google and I could send you the coordinates on an email. You can see the village where my country house is situated and you can see the from the sky what <laughs> what our country house looks like. If I just give you these two names. Uh, but uh, to, to explain it in a few words, uh, we are situated on the 57th parallel north uh, here in Europe, uh, which on the North American continent would bring you somewhere in Angaba Bay, uh, the very far north of Canada, uh, where the climate is, is brutally, brutally cold. Uh, this is not the case in Europe. Why? Because of the Gulf Stream, of course. Uh, and even though it flows past Norway, and in between you have Norway, Sweden, the Baltic Sea and then the three Baltic countries on the other side of the Baltic Sea, uh, we, we have a temperate climate with four seasons and fall has just really set in with leaves falling and so on. Uh, we have a parliamentary republic, whereas you in the United States have a presidential republic. It makes a considerable difference in the distribution of power in the checks and balances uh, that the country possesses. Notably, uh, there's an uh, enormous difference in the way a president is chosen, uh, elected, and, and takes, uh, takes over as, uh, as head of state. Uh, the American elections remain, to me personally, a mystery. 
in terms of how exactly they are run and and how it is all going to play out i i i know the if you like the basics uh, the rule of thumb facts about how the american system uh, works but you see uh people like Paine in the 19th in their 19th century britain when they talked about the rights of man uh, one of the things that Paine was complaining about the Britain of 19th century was that you did not have one man, one vote. Well, the American Constitution, which is a lovely piece uh, of, of uh, declarative uh, oratory and, and conceptually very inspiring, um, does have a few lacunae. There's a few things missing. It says that all men are created equal. It does not mention women. And it does not even acknowledge the existence of some who are not men, but slaves. And this is why you had a civil war uh, in the United States at the very time when in, in Europe, particularly in Eastern and Northern Europe, there were nations who were actually serfs under the Tsarist rule. Uh, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, parts of Poland were under a, a totalitarian monar monarchy that had serfs. And serfdom was abolished in, in Kurland, in the western part uh, of Latvia, where I now reside, um, in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but in the western, on the eastern part, on the Russian, what is now Russia, on that border, um, uh, nearly 50 years later, and it made a, a true, truly significant difference in the development of these two parts of the country, economically, socially, and, and in other ways. So you see, even as America was having a civil war about the liberation of slaves imported from a different continent, we had a different situation here. The local people, the auto autochthonous populations, uh, the native peoples of America, if you like, their equivalent here in Europe, uh, were the, the oppressed parts of society, uh, reduced to serfdom since the late Middle Ages, basically, uh, in, in the case of Latvia, particularly since the 18th century, when uh, the rule uh, of the country was taken over by the Tsarist conquest. 1795 was the last date when the Duchy of Kurland uh, uh, ceased to exist uh, and, and was taken over by the Tsarist Empire. Well, uh, the, the development of these nations was based on a wish to have a right to self-determination where they, because of their language, because of their ethnic uh, belonging, were automatically at birth, just like slaves, relegated to being, as in the case of Latvia, that all the, the, the press of the day, which was dominated by Baltic Germans, said um, Latvians have no culture, they have never had the nation, and it's true, we, we had separate kingdoms, we did not have a unified Latvia, such as was created in the 20th century, uh, therefore they have no future, they, they must always be peasants and, 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 and farmers, and they cannot, uh, anything like uh, social mobility, uh, should be forbidden to them. And the National Awakening Movement was one of asking for the right of people born as Latvians to speak their language, to be educated in their language, to be educated, period, <laughs> beyond, beyond um, uh, uh, since the Reformation there had been basic schooling, at least a few years of reading and writing, uh, but the right to actually to pursue education uh, and ultimately to have uh, developed their own culture and, and, and their own governance uh, in separate countries. So when you hear nowadays people saying uh, the world is going to the dogs because they are a nationalist sentiment, especially in Europe, and they are the ones that are preventing international cooperation and, and multilateralism, let us not forget uh, that you, you should not confuse nationalism in the sense of patriotism and the, the uh, uh, asking for maintaining one's rights because of belonging of a certain ethnic group or linguistic group with the Nazism, the na national socialism, which the Nazis developed, which is an, an, you know, a beast of a different color entirely and has nothing to do with it. Well, to return to our, to our constitution, the constitution says that you can become president uh, if you're 40 years old at least, curiously enough, 
and and you're a Latvian citizen. That's it. Uh, you don't have to be born in Latvia. You don't have to have been residing in Latvia, which is very fortunate. I was born in Latvia, but I left it as, as uh, our home in Riga uh, at the age of six, three days before the, the Russian army walked in. Uh, and uh, I returned at 60 after taking my early retirement as a Canadian professor, in between having lived in refugee camps in Germany just after the war and then in North Africa in the French protectorate of Morocco. Uh, and, and, and having sort of knocked around the world. Um, our election uh, is not a, a direct popular vote. It's, uh, it's a representative democracy so that the parliament elects the president. So the people elect the parliament, the parliamentarians, we have 100 of them, uh, they elect the president. And I, as, a, as a, somebody repatriating from the diaspora of refugees who had fled the communist regime, which, which ruled here for 50 years, returning back to my native country. Uh, I arrived in October 1988 uh, to head the Latin Institute, in fact, to create the Latin Institute. And eight months later, the parliament elected me as president. I had never been member of a political party, was not a member of a political party, I'm not a member of any political party right now. I did not have an uh, election campaign. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the whole process uh, sounds uh, slightly surrealistic, I think, uh, in, Amer in American uh, eyes and ears, because from what I hear uh, on the internet about what is happening in America, I hear such things as, yes, uh, Mr. Biden seems to be making progress because they have raised so many millions for him in such and such a state and so many millions in such and such a state. And when the chosen, the candidates were being chosen by each party, uh, all that uh, the news were presenting was uh, candidate one was, uh, had managed to uh, gather so many millions in the last three weeks. Uh, candidate two had uh, 15 million more. Candidate three was lagging behind and candidate four was completely out because he wasn't raising enough millions. And I, in my naive mind uh, and understanding, I, I was watching this and trying to fathom how did a democracy which was founded on that beautiful declaration of independence with this and, and a country that was the leader of the free world and, and, uh, and, and championed and, and supported uh, democracy movements everywhere and, and continues to this day in many ways in spite of the various moves taken uh, by President uh, Trump in his last four years. How could such a country come to the point where a candidate to the highest office in the land and in the land which is a presidential country where the president has enormous powers? It's not just that somebody carries a suitcase with a red button of nuclear arms uh, always at his side uh, uh, and, and that uh, the United States has the most powerful military resources of anybody on the planet right now, that its economy still even now is number one on the whole planet. But how is it possible that money has become not just a means of exchange in a free market economy of which uh, America is justly proud, having broken down the kind of barriers that European, for instance, France, before the revolution, had taxes and customs between each region of the country. So how can a country develop economically when even within it there's a taxes. The free market in Europe, that was the beginning of the European Union. It started out as a common market. The United States was a, was a pioneer in establishing this free movement uh, of goods. How has it come that it has used money, the money gathered as an expression, as a definition of who a candidate is and not what they are, who they are, what is their experience and what it is that they're offering their country. I would be very happy to have these young people in America, but in other countries with different systems of election, reflect about it and explain to me the, the things that I don't understand. And I'm of course happy to explain the sorts of things I have experienced uh, in my life 
uh, and uh, about which I, I do know, uh, as well as the ones that I, I worry about and that I wonder about. But thank you. Thank you for your attention. All I can say is you young people, I would beg you to really consider seriously what is the worth of an individual and of a person. What is your worth in the world? What can you contribute? But by doing so, what do you consider as the worth of somebody else? Is it the amount of money they can sort of gather around themselves in various ways? Is it their good looks? Is it their designer clothing? Is it their fame? The number of clicks on the internet that they get on the Facebook or something like that? What is it that makes the worth of a person? Because that is important to understand so that you, in your own skin, you can truly feel the worth that you have as an individual and go forth into life with assurance of your rights, uh, with an expectation of, of the, that the, the, the doors that you wish opened, are, it's possible for you to open, but particularly with an understanding that others have the same heart as you do and the same aspirations and the same hopes and that you will all the more be able to achieve your uh, dreams come true if you respect those of everybody else around you and possibly help them along if possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President. Really insightful. I'm going to now pass to Graham Strickland, who's a member of our Youth Advisory with Speak Truth to Power. Um, and he has a few questions that came in earlier with the registration. And I'd ask any attendee, if you have a question, um, please submit it in the chat and we will uh, do our best to get to the questions that are submitted. So Graham, I'm going to pass to you. Thank you so much. Well, it is an honor to have you speak with us and have you with us here today, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> so during my studies in international relations, it was always leaders that pushed history towards the side of social justice that inspired um, students like me to pursue career paths in public service. And so um, it is for that reason that I'm sure uh, students who submitted these questions today have similar sentiments. Um, and so starting with our first question, um, who inspired you to get into politics and who inspires you now? I did not believe that I would ever go into politics as long as I didn't have a country to which I felt I had the birthright uh, to belong uh, and to participate in its governance. Um, I spent uh, the early part of my life uh, as a refugee who's, uh, who was registered in my mother's um, foreign passport of the Republic of Latvia. And I remember when on our way uh, to Canada, uh, the boat we had taken in Gibraltar uh, stopped in Lisbon. Everybody was allowed to go ashore to visit Lisbon. Uh, when we uh, came uh, uh, there to, to step down, uh, there was a local policeman uh, checking passports. And uh, my mom and dad presented their passports, which miraculously the Red Cross had found in Germany, and they had uh, the foreign passports of the Republic of Latvia. And we were told by, uh, by the policeman there was no such a country as Latvia anymore, that there was a Soviet Union and we didn't have Soviet passports and therefore we couldn't land. Later, when I was president and visiting uh, Portugal on a state visit, the then President Sampaio said uh, proudly how Portugal had never recognized the annexation uh, of, of Latvia to the Soviet Union, which is not true. I told him I could not see Lisbon. I could see it from the distance from the boat. I never set foot in Lisbon until Salazar's fall uh, because they did not uh, recognize the, the passports of Latvia. So, uh, how in Canada, when I arrived, everybody called me a new Canadian. And I noticed that all prime ministers have been either Anglo-Canadians or Franco-Canadians. I never saw uh, a surname that was not Max something or, or, or a French-Canadian name. Uh, so um, I felt that I felt alienated. I, I felt that my chances of, of getting a constituency in a country like that are extremely limited. 
and uh, and I decided the heck with it. I, I'm going into science and devote my life to that. After all, the world needs um, science. It needs knowledge. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching young people how to think critically. Uh, it's it's a useful life. But I did I did get involved in Latvian affairs. Uh, I did get involved in movements uh, to keep Latvian language and culture alive across a diaspora that was scattered. Uh, a small diaspora by compared to those of, of Greeks or Italians either in Canada or in or in Australia uh, or, or uh, Brazil, Venezuela, um, New Zealand, Australia and so Europe, uh, the States, uh, Canada, I I was I traveled a lot and, and gave speeches about the importance of keeping uh, uh, memory alive of your origins, where you come from, uh, a culture because your country has been taken from you or from your from your parents or grandparents by by force against their will. They left it against their will. They did not come as free immigrants. They came as refugees, and uh, you should keep that uh, that flame alive that they have a right. Uh, to independence, uh, liberty, uh, and that someday uh, these countries should recover what was brutally taken away from them. And, well, you see the miracle is that they actually did. So when the country was free, of course, I was at the, towards ending with the end of my, my, my uh, academic career, and I thought I, I, I might as well lay, uh, end and get my pension and then go to Latvia and not be a burden on the on the economy, which was a shambles naturally after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, but I could start thinking about it, but I was not interested in party politics very much. Being a, uh, Having been an independently thinking academic all my life, the idea of bowing to, to, to sort of party uh, discipline and, and, and party uh, as, as a ready-made system was very difficult for me. And Latvia has a constitution which was just, it fit me like a glove because you could be a president on the contrary. Anybody who was a member of a party had to lay down their uh, affiliation with the party during the presidency. President was supposed to be neutral. That was just sort of custom made for, for a person like me. Well, thank you for sharing and um, sharing, um, I guess, your connection to uh, your Latvian culture and how that um, got you into to politics. Um, and I guess we want to ask you a little bit about um, sort of in your involvement, either in academia or um, in your involvement in Latvian politics, uh, what challenges had you face um, that were unique to you as a uh, woman in power? As uh, once I was uh, uh, elected president, um, I mean, that moment. I, either either once you were elected or um, prior to that as well. Well, during my career as an academic, uh, I was admitted to McGill University, which at the time had a very famous professor, Professor Head, uh, uh, at its head, uh, and. Um, uh, was an excellent uh, center of learning in, in, in psychology, in, uh, psycho also uh, neurobiology and, and that sort of thing. Um, Professor Hebb at, at one point expressed, uh, they accepted us on the basis of the SAT scores. We, we sat these exams and on the basis of the scores and of our recommendations and our previous marks in um, bachelor's and master's levels, they were very fair in accepting everybody who, who answered to the criteria. But several older professors, including this famous professor, whose uh, name had attracted, uh, I think, most of the students to McGill at the time, uh, he said at one point, oh, you girls sitting here in my seminar. You know, I sometimes think, gee, what a pity, you know, you're taking up space that a real student could be taking who will become a real, a real scientist and a real researcher. Um, we sort of felt that we have to take everybody who has the marks, but really, you're going to get married and have children, and it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a waste. And we were, I think, uh, in that whole class, we were three or four women who curiously loved, had already uh, entered, we were married already, and in fact, uh, became pregnant several of us during the end of our doctoral studies. But later, when I talked to these, <laughs> to these fellow students, how had they had felt about that remark, they said, I was 
maybe spurred on in my career to work harder than I might have done because to be, to have a family and a scientific career and a teaching career is difficult. I'll grant you that. But when I thought of what the old bastard told us about us taking up space unnecessarily, I was spurred on by the thought, I'm going to show them. As a president, my first concern was, how was I going to get my hair done and get everything else done as well? And it turns out we managed. <laughs> it was not <laughs> a crushing obstacle. Um, thank you. And we have a follow-up question to that uh, from the audience. Uh, Kate um, asks, uh, what would you say to aspiring, uh, an aspiring female who is seeking to protect human rights on an international level? She should roll up her sleeves and, and, and gear up for, for a lifelong battle uh, because uh, there's a long way to go uh, in a great many countries, including in progressive ones, in democratic ones, uh, because once the brutal external prejudices have been overcome, or at least we have reached a point in a country where it has become politically incorrect to express uh, prejudice against women. Oh, talk about politically correct. As a young professor, I remember uh, going to a party uh, at, at my former university where a, a new professor had been hired from the States, a bright young thing, uh, and uh, uh, we were you know, standing around chatting as, as people do at these, at these uh, uh, parties uh, of, uh, of the 60s uh, and 70s. And he started uh, asking me what, what I was doing. I said, well, I'm a professor, you know, on the other side of the mountain of, uh, at the center of Montreal in the French university, uh, and I'm a professor there. And he started saying, oh, really, you're a professor? Well, women can't be professors. And I mean, uh, uh, women can't be, uh, can't be uh, scientists, and, uh, and, and women can't do this and can't do that. And I said, really? I said, oh, uh, how's that? Can you, can you explain to me how this, you know, uh, how do you come to, the, to these brilliant conclusions and, and do tell us? And we started having a crowd gather around us, you see, with their cocktail glasses in hand and, and, and stopping to, uh, eating their, their cheese and, and crackers and, and, and listening to this man pontificate about how women could not really, they didn't belong in academia, they didn't belong in science. How many f famous chefs were there in the world? How many famous painters? How many famous musicians? I mean, what, what did women ever do? And I just let him, I let him carry on, I let him carry on. And, so then, and, and people were gathering around and he was becoming more and more extreme in his pronouncements. And frankly, he started sounding more and more foolish. I didn't say a word, I just said, do tell us about it. And finally he saw the audience around looking at him and he realized he was out of tune. And I mercifully didn't have, he expected me, you see, to start shouting and screaming and defending women and explaining how women are just as good as men and so on. I didn't say a word. I said, explain your views, your prejudice, well, didn't say prejudice, no, just, you know, your, your wisdom. Where does it come from? What's it based on? And he so lost the audience that was following him. He so become looking, he became looking foolish that he turned to me at the end and he said, you know something? You really know how to give a man enough rope to hang himself with. And it's a trick that I have used more than once in my life. And it works better frequently than having a direct confrontation and trying to counter every single argument with content. Just give the person enough rope to hang themselves with, with the foolishness of the arguments that they present. Well, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and so we, we have a question um, from Chelly. Um, and so they ask, uh, why, why did it take you uh, so long uh, to come back from Latvia? Um, and then we have another question from Will um, in the same class. Um, as a child, what was it like to live as a refugee and how has that impacted you? Living as a refugee child, um, 
has has two two sides of a coin. Uh, one is that it's a grim life <laughs> in, in a great many ways. <laughs> There's not two ways about it. Uh, but um, on the other hand, you are a child uh, and, and you have playmates and, and you have your joys and your freedom. Uh, I remember in, uh, wandering about the city of Lübeck where we spent most of, uh, after the end of the war, uh, the, period, the last months of the war and, and the beginning uh, of 45 were horrible for, for my family and for me. I don't, I still have nightmares about that. I still have nightmares about the end of the war. I really do uh, and can't get rid of him as a psychologist. But we had fun as well. We would play hopscotch, for instance. We would play tag. I mean, it's, it's free. We didn't have books, we didn't have toys. I, I wished, oh, I wished to have paper and pencil uh, to draw and, and to color didn't have them. Uh, but we, we found other joys. And uh, at one point I even started a herbarium, except I didn't have glue. <laughs> uh, I found some paper, but I didn't have glue to glue the stuff in, you see, things like that. So I can't say it was all grimness. Uh, uh, there was, uh, and the Latin, the, see, refugees were put mercifully by the United States, you know, sorry, the United Nations, United Nations Refugee Relief uh, Organization, UNRWA, uh, they uh, had put refugees by nationality and the Latvians went crazy with having cultural events. They published newspapers, they published books, they had choirs singing, dancers dancing, tutors tooting and fluters fluting and, and I mean there was something going on and they created the schools that the occupation forces didn't give two hoots about the education of the refugees. It was the refugees themselves who organized schooling. I had all, by the time I entered university in Canada, together with my uh, fellow uh, students from grade 13 in Canada, who had had 13 years of schooling, I had had, I think, eight and a half or nine years of schooling in three different languages, but I did okay. As, as uh, somebody had said, it's, uh, uh, you sometimes you have to try as a woman or as a refugee, you have to try twice as hard Fortunately, it's not difficult. That's awesome. Um, and shifting uh, sort of to the uh, current political uh, environment, um, Adam has a question. Um, so he says, uh, his question is regarding the dissemination of information. Um, he says, the US is now experiencing an unprecedented amount of uh, effort to control or manipulate information that citizens receive. He says further that the freedom of press has been compromised. How would you uh, put this into context and compare it to your experience uh, to the Soviet era in Latvia? Uh, during the Soviet era, there was they built um, a, a multi-story building uh, on the shores of, of the uh, River Daugav in the center of Riga, the capital, and all publications where all uh, periodical publications, newspapers, uh, journals, and so on, had their uh, editorial offices there. And the censors had their extensive uh, offices there as well. Not a word could get published anywhere if it did not go through the active censorship process uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of these of these offices controlled by by what you call the Cheka, that is the the secret police, uh, linked to the uh, orders of the party, um, the the communist party, uh, the uh, publishing of books, on the other hand, uh, was uh, under a different censor. Uh, anybody who ever published a book. Uh, whether poetry, prose, or fiction or non-fiction, had to be a member of the Writers' Union. To become a member of the uh, Writers' Union, you had to have the right biography. Uh, you had biography, very important. Who your parents, grandparents were, what their political uh, status had been, what, uh, what your own uh, opinions were, had you ever made, uh, given any signs of being nationalistically inclined and, and that sort of thing. Uh, or were you loyal to the great, uh, what they called the great fatherland uh, of, of, you know, the Soviet Union, where all, all the nations, all the, 
uh, all the peoples are equal, but some of the Russians were more equal than others. Uh, the, uh, of course, even for members of the Writers' Union, everything had to go through official censorship. Unfortunately, in democracies, you do not have this sort of censorship, but you have self-censorship and you have um, uh, commitment, either political or monetary, on the part of those people who have access to media. And increasingly now, uh, a horrible danger of the world is the, the bots, the, 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 the robots, the, 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 uh, the ability to, to pollute the, the airwaves and, and uh, visual waves with uh, false information completely fabricated, totally fabricated, false news. Uh, you can imitate somebody somebody's speaking and put different words in their mouth. There are horrible things happening. And this is why under NATO, I am so glad that we have a center, for instance, in Latvia and also in our neighboring countries, about how to decipher, how to decipher absolute brutal disinformation. Uh, it should be part, I was part of a, uh, of a group created by the European uh, Commission on the freedom uh, of, uh, of the press uh, and of the media in uh, in the European Union. And what we recommended, one of the things was that starting from grade school, students should be taught how to uh, evaluate the sources from which they get their information. You cannot fact uh, check, you know, uh, a military conflict that's happening on a different continent. You cannot fact check uh, uh, events that happen in a different state from yours, even in a different part of the city where you were not present. But you can evaluate the source who committed the information to you. That is a very crucial element, one of the elements in estimating how you get your information. So I would say that um, as, as you grow up from grade school up to high school and then and university, and, but every citizen Every senior citizen, even who never heard about these things before, should be really warned about the dangers of uncritically taking at face value everything they hear said, because it is truly dangerous for the stability and health of society. It really is. Thank you. Um, it's very illuminating um, seeing that historical comparison, um, both in your experience and, and, and now. Um, so we have another question from uh, Sakin. Uh, they ask, uh, what do you think that other countries like America uh, could learn from the Latvian political system and history? Um, I know you talked a little bit more um, about this earlier on with um, the parliamentary system, um, but could you dive a little bit more um, into to what we could learn from you and from Latvia? Well, one thing that we do not have uh, is the, the immense role that uh, money plays in elections. Uh, of course, we have our mini oligarchs, we are, we are a small country, our economy is, is, is not enormous, uh, but nonetheless, especially during the early days of privatization and shifting over to, uh, to private enterprise, uh, the privatization of what had been collectivized under communism uh, took on uh, some forms that uh, amounted to, to appropriating state uh, property, you see, uh, through various schemes. Uh, and it, it was a, that was a pain of all post-communist countries. Transitions are never easy, and this one was not uh, either. Um, the, I think the, the ability to conduct elections without having such incredibly I mean, un unimaginable vast sums of money spent on television advertising and on ads vilifying each other. Um, I think if the public, I think the public has a role to play in this. If the public stopped watching them and if the public stopped donating to these things, they said, look, I will, I will donate for an ad where such and such a party will explain what their stand is on, on public health uh, and how much public health should we have at the, at the federal, at the state, at the municipal level. Uh, where do I stand on, on education? Where do I stand on abortion? Where do I stand on gay marriage? Where do I stand on whatever? 
that that the citizen has a right to actually hear, and if it costs money to, to, for the candidate to express this, then yes, it's a legitimate way of spending money. But I think the, the extent, see, we have, ah, one thing you could learn, we have a limit on the spending on your electoral expenses. It's childishly <laughs> easy and simple to do. <laughs> you put a cap on it and pow, that's it, not beyond. That's great. Um, thank you. And so shifting a little bit more to uh, some of the regional conflict, um, would you share some of your thoughts on the, the current war between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Um, I hope it's not a war. I really do. Uh, I hope that it's not an out and out war uh, for neither country has so far declared war on others, though uh, I, I fear that the uh, um, the president of Turkey coming to the aid of, of Azerbaijan by saying that we will, will support them to, to reconquer their territories uh, in a way is, is maybe not the most helpful way of, of helping the situation. Uh, in international law is uh, absolutely clear that uh, Azerbaijan has uh, a certain bound, uh, set of boundaries uh, and all the countries that became independent at the collapse of the Soviet Union kept their boundaries that they had had before. Now it's very interesting the attitude of Russia towards this by the way to, to just to, and aside from these two, to uh, Russia and Ukraine. President Putin claimed Crimea uh, as part of Russia because it had been part of Russia in Tsarist times. Uh, uh, and he said that it had been given to Ukraine by Khrushchev, who was a Ukrainian eth ethnically, uh, uh, although a horribly renegade uh, Ukrainian had participated in, in genocide of, of his compatriots, but that's another story. Uh, under Khrushchev, uh, Crimea had been put as part of uh, Ukraine, and this is where it was and belongs, according to international law, uh, to this day. But President Putin said, no, we do not recognize these um, uh, post-Stalin uh, period uh, borders. Um, uh, it was, it was, uh, it belonged to Russia and Tsarist times, and we want it back. But in the case of Latvia, <laughs> we have a territory, uh, five percent of, of our land surface, which was uh, given to Latvia by uh, by the Versailles uh, Treaty, sort of uh, international commissions that set the borders at the end of First World War, and it was given to Latvia because there's a railway railway sort of not in one city and and it was partly it was a borderline area inhabited by both russians and ethnic latvians that when we wanted to ha sign a peace treaty with russia president putin insisted that they had kept it since the collapse of the soviet union and russia was the russian federation was going to keep it because it had been <laughs> stalin had actually drawn the border elsewhere, and Stalin had given that territory to, to the Russian Federative Republic. Because you were supposedly having these republics inside the Soviet Union. It was a union like the United States. So, in the case of Latvia, in order to take away our territory, he referred back to Stalin's borders that Stalin had drawn. In the case of Crimea, he did not accept the, the Soviet time borders, he went back to Tsarist times. In other words, whichever border um, you wish to have, you will find the, you sort of find a matching historical uh, uh, process which makes it belong to you. Now, many places in, in Europe are contested and have been contested all over the centuries. The border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, particularly the enclave of, of Nagorno-Karabakh, is a contested region because of this ethnic composition, uh, which was certainly during Soviet times, there was an Armenianization of, of the population, but the border includes that into Azerbaijan. And when at the collapse of the Soviet Union, then there, war, there was a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and the Armenians took part of the Azerbaijani 
territory that surrounds Nagorno-Karabakh and keep it to this day. This is against international law. Uh, four different uh, you know, uh, uh, Security Council resolutions of the United Nations have uh, condemned uh, this occupation and uh, Latvia, along with all other European Union countries, recognizes the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan as including these territories occupied by Armenia, uh, including Nagorno-Karabakh, in other words, considers Armenian presence there, or uh, supposedly a semi-autonomous republic or whatever, as in, uh, internationally uh, uh, unacceptable and against international law. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I want to ask one more question to wrap off, wrap, wrap up before I hand it off to Karen. Um, ending a bit on a positive note, um, is there anything that you see now as a positive trend towards democracy and human rights that offers you a, a glimpse of hope for the future? Absolutely. It's young people like you uh, in, in, in your country, in my country uh, and elsewhere who are waking up to the fact that there's a great deal that is not right uh, in the world and is not right uh, in, in where we're going. Uh, and that the generations who have reached the age of being actively engaged in governance, in politics, uh, in, in, uh, in opinion shaping in society and so on, I think they need all the help they can get from young people who are still full of idealism, uh, who have not been you know, jaded and become blasé about ideals, but actually believe in them uh, and believe that it's possible uh, to uh, to have applications in practice that, if they are not ideal, come as close to ideal as they possibly can. And I think as older generations get tired of the fight, although I must say I'm not exactly a spring chicken, I'm still ready to fight, granted, I, I do think that uh, the, the youth and, and the, the energy uh, that young people have and the, and the freshness of, of vision and of thought Truly, that is uh, our best hope for the future. And I wish you all uh, to, keep, uh, to keep your eyes shining and to keep your ideals bright and to keep working for them. Good luck to you. Well, well thank you. And it's been a pleasure uh, to speak with you, uh, Madam President. Um, and now I'm going to hand it back to, to Karen to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Graham, for that and for uh, facilitating those questions. I kept sending him little messages, and then I realized he's more than capable. I think it's the mother in me, but thank you, Graham. That was brilliant. Um, I want to thank Robchan and the Nisami Ganjavi International Center again. And Madam President, you know, I'm reading um, texts that are coming in to me, and um, you are uh, – you are the leader that we need. Your voice is a voice we need in this world. And it is so appreciated. And someone was like, I, uh, I got you are the bomb and you rock. Uh, so those are two texts that came through. Um, so with much appreciation um, and, thank and thank you so much for your insight, your wisdom, your story, the history, um, all of it I think will broaden um, our perspective on how we see the world and we will absolutely be sharing this recording with the classes that could not join today. So many teachers um, were excited to hear from you and managing all of the demands these days are really tricky. So thank you. Um, we will Thanks, have an, yeah, you're so, so inspiring. Um, we will have an, another session next month. Please be on the lookout for that. And if you want to get involved, I shared the Nisami Center um, website to learn more about that, to learn more about Madam President. There's so much online about her. Um, as I mentioned before, her TEDx talk from, I think it was 2013. Um, really, I just, I, I, lo I loved it. Um, so, so much that you can learn. And if you want to join Speak Truth to Power, please go to RFK Human Rights to learn more about what we're doing um, to broaden the lens through which we all see, engage, and take action in this world. So.